they mate with the um, fertile ones out there, thereby occupying the fertile ones, and they give birth to no offspring, you reduce the number of uh, mosquitoes that are born uh, as a consequence of that. That's a um, uh, use of genetic uh, engineering. Um, transgenic mustard. Okay, I, I forget why this picture is even here, but it reminds me of something that actually has an OSU connection. Um, there is a um, tomato on the market. Um, I'm not even sure if it's still on the market. It was one of the early ones that came out called the Flavor Saver Tomato. The Flavor Saver Tomato um, is a genetically engineered tomato that allows, uh, it has a longer shelf life because some of the genes involved in uh, basically breaking down things inside the tomato have been deleted. That actually has an OSU connection. There was a person from OSU um, who had um, worked on that and helped to develop that tomato. Okay, uh, you hear about a lot of genetically, uh, genetically altered products that are out there. Genetically modified organisms or GMOs are in some cases controversial in terms of what's been put in there. Uh, I won't step into that controversy and say it's good or bad. I personally think that there are good and bad applications of any technology, including GMOs. Uh, so uh, you should, if you're not aware of these things, perhaps read up on them a little bit because they will affect your food supply in the rest of uh, your lives. Okay. Um, a technology I would like to just say a word about, I haven't talked about it so far, but I, I think now is the appropriate place to talk about it. It's called the polymerase chain reaction. And the polymerase chain reaction is, I said that the um, uh, restriction enzymes were one of the first tools that really made modern biotechnology possible. A second tool that made modern bi biotechnology even more accessible was the polymerase chain reaction. So I'll tell you just a little bit about that. The polymerase chain reaction is also called PCR. And PCR is a way of amplifying a fragment of DNA. Amplifying. What do I mean by amplifying? I mean this. If I start with one fragment that I want to amplify, and I use the polymerase chain reaction, at the end of one cycle of the reaction, I end up with two. At the end of two cycles of reaction, I end up with four. At the end of three cycles of reaction, I end up with eight. It grows exponentially. Now, that might seem magical. It's not, of course, magical, because the same sort of thing happens with cells. If I have one cell and it divides, I have two. Those two cells divide, I have four. Those four cells divide, I have eight. PCR uses DNA replication technology derived from cells. So just as cells divide logarithmically, the growth of cells is logarithmic, so too is the growth of the DNA produced by those cells. Now, polymerase chain reaction does not occur in a cell. It occurs in a test tube. Occurs in a test tube. Now, in the test tube, what happens is we trick DNA polymerase to making DNA according to what we want, not according to what the cell wants. So I need to tell you how we do that. Okay? Well, I should also maybe give you an idea of the magnitude of this before I do that. Okay? With a polymerase chain reaction, we typically run about 30 cycles. In 30 cycles of the polymerase chain reaction, we can go from having one copy of a piece of DNA to having a billion identical copies of that same DNA. That can be done in the span of a couple of hours. Okay? That's what amplification is about. Okay? Going from one to a billion. Using the polymerase chain reaction, we can, you hear about the crime shows and all the, the blah, 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 where they find a drop of blood or they find a hair or they find some saliva or something that's left behind the crime scene, the reason that they're able to identify that, uh, link it to an individual, is because of the ability to amplify that. If you couldn't amplify that, there would be no way to do that. So the polymerase chain reaction allows you to do that. The polymerase chain reaction is used by the um, uh, anthro uh, by um, uh, archaeologists as well. Okay? Sometimes at a site, they will find a single intact human hair untouched by a human hand since the time it fell out of the person's head. They can actually amplify the DNA on there and determine where, uh, of what ethnic origin that person was, which I still find is a remarkable thing. Okay? So there's some very cool technologies that, uh, the PCR is a very cool technology that allows us to do amazing things. How do we do it? Well, 
Let's think about the requirements that we had for DNA replication in the cell. What were they? We had to have a DNA polymerase. What else did we have to have? We had to have a primer. What else did we have to have? What's that? The triphosphates. We had to have DNTPs, right? What else did we have to have? Something to copy. Had to have four things, OK? So in the cell, that copying starts at one place. It starts at an origin. Well, if we only had things copying at an origin, what if the fragment of DNA we want doesn't have an origin? That's not going to work, right? We have, to have, we have to manipulate the system. So we manipulate the system. Here's what we do. We design what are called prime, we design primers. Primers in the cell are RNAs that are made by primase. For PCR, we don't use RNA. We actually make DNA primers. We can make them in a laboratory. I can go to a machine, and I can punch in a sequence that says, give me the following sequence, G, G, A, G, C, G, T, T, G, G, C, G, A, 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 something like that. Okay? And the machine will, using chemistry, synthesize that little piece. How do I pick a piece? Well, let's say I know that I've got the genome of a person, and I know a region that varies from one person to another. I know a sequence right next to it that doesn't vary. There's one of my primers. I design something that's complementary to that region next to it. I design a second primer that's over here that's complementary to a region that doesn't vary either. And I use those two primers. That's what I do. I have two primers, one on either side of the region I'm trying to amplify. One pointed this way, one pointed this way. Okay, So I designed my primers to be complementary to regions around the thing I want to amplify. Then I simply take my DNAs and I boil them. I boil them. When I boil DNA, the strands come apart because, remember, only hydrogen bonds are holding them together. I let them cool down, and if I'm very careful in letting them cool down, those primers will find their complementary regions and sit right there on the strand. So now I've got a duplex region, I've got a primer, and they're pointed, one on the top strand, one on the bottom strand, they're pointed in opposite directions. My DNA polymerase says, oh, I see a primer, I've got four DNTPs, I start going this way, I start going this way, and where I had two strands before, I now have four. I boil it. Guess what happens? They come apart. More primers come in. And now the four strands become eight. The eight strands become 16. The 16 strands become 32. That's how it works. The primers defined ultimately the ends of the fragments that I'm amplifying. Now, one of the advances in PCR was the discovery that there were organisms that live at temperatures near that of boiling water. That means that their DNA polymerases don't get beat up when you boil them. Most enzymes don't survive that. So they went to Yellowstone. It's a true story. They went to Yellowstone National Park. They went to one of those geysers where all that hot water and all that muck is, and they isolated organisms out there that were living in that boiling water, and they isolated their DNA polymerase. They had what we describe as a thermostable DNA polymerase. That means I can squirt the DNA polymerase in there, and even though I boil the solution to separate the strands, the DNA polymerase stays stable. It's ready to replicate. Whenever I have a, it has, it sees a primer, it goes and it replicates. That's pretty cool. It's because of that I don't have to squirt in more enzyme each time I do the reaction. I squirt it in once. I go through 30 cycles of boiling, okay, letting the primers fall on it, replicating. Boiling, letting the primers come on, replicating. Boiling, letting the primers come on, replicating. Okay, That's what a cycle consists of. Boiling, allowing the cycle, and by the way, allowing the primers to come on is at a slightly different temperature. It's called the annealing temperature. Then there's a replication temperature. Boil, anneal, replicate. Boil, anneal, replicate. That's a cycle of PCR. It's a phenomenal technique. And as I said, we can amplify DNAs billions of times doing something like just that. Questions about that? Yes, Lynette. Can you spell anneal? Anneal. A-N-N-E-A-L. Yes, ma'am. Yes. 
if you're saying one little strand uh -huh. isn't enough for it to identify, they have to amplify. So Correct. You're making the exact same thing over sure. and over. Okay. So that in curves, you need like, a certain amount to be able yep. to figure out what it is. You do. You do. Okay, so she's puzzled because I say, well, if I don't know what it is, how do I get it in the first place? And then if I, once I've got it, I know what it is, why did I amplify it? It's kind of, it seems like, a, like it's backwards, if, if I understand what you're saying. What is the technology that needs a certain pile of it? I'll give, you, I'll give you a quick, real easy example to see, okay? So there's a technique called restriction fragment length polymorphism, or it's called RFLP, okay? There's a couple ways you can do it. One is you can cut up DNA. And when you do, people who have different DNAs are going to have different lengths of fragments that come out. The problem with that is it takes a ton of DNA. All right? And what you're looking at are differences in sequence. You're looking for different lengths. What if you put the primers around the regions that vary in length? Then all you have to do is say, what size are they? You run them on a gel, and you say, here's my fragment that is amplified by these primers, and it's 1,500 base pairs. Here's yours, and it's 800 base pairs. So simply by looking at the size, that's one simple way of distinguishing them. Other ways of distinguishing them is to actually determine the DNA sequence of those fragments. So if I determined the sequence, then I would know every single nucleotide and how that differed between, say, you and, you and I. So even though we might have the same length, we might have different sequences. Does that make sense? OK. Let's see. So, um, paternity testing. Okay. Paternity testing involves all of these techniques. It involves um, looking, again, for differences in the DNA, in this case, of the offspring, compared to that of dad. Okay. So, here are two parents. All right. If I look at a particular region where we realize I'm going to have two copies of everything. I'm going to have one copy from mom. I'm going to have one copy from my dad. My wife is going to have one copy from her mother, one copy from her father. So she might have fragments that look, um, when we cut them up, look uh, like this. OK, they're only showing one uh, particular fragment here. All right, so let's say mom had, had two copies here, and I had two copies here. The child's going to get one from mom, one from dad, and we would expect that if we know the, per the parentage as we think we do, those will match up. If, however, we see that dad's one for this child is over here, we say, uh-oh, the mailman was, was busy, right? Make sense? Yes? I'm sorry? Yeah, so why are paternity tests 100% sure? Because they rely on partly on size, and so you might have two individuals who have, for example, the same size, but they're still different individuals. And so you try to pick things that are as unique as possible, but there's not, that's not always the case. So when we do something called DNA fingerprinting, what we're trying to do in, in the case of a criminal is we're, trying, we're comparing a whole bunch of different sizes. And by doing a whole bunch of different sizes, we limit the likelihood that any two individuals have the exact same ones. But all we can do is say the chances of two having the same is one in a billion or one in a trillion of doing that. Because it's always possible you might find two people that had the same sizes. Does that sort of make sense? Um, and it's, it's a size determination, really, that, that, that causes us to have that. There was a very interesting, speaking of DNA uh, sequencing technology, there was a very interesting paper that was just announced this past week about uh, humans interbreeding with Neanderthals. Have you guys, have you guys heard about this? Very interesting stuff. So there's been debate for a long time to have humans interbred with Neanderthals or not. And now, uh, at least according to this uh, recent paper, it sounds like there's some pretty good evidence that human beings did, in fact, breed with Neanderthals. Um, and it happened very shortly after uh, emigration out of Africa. Um, very, very interesting stuff. If you haven't seen that paper, you should, uh, uh, you should read about it, because it, it really tells a lot about human uh, evolution, which I think is kind of cool. OK. I should also, and I don't think I've got it on here. Um, no, I don't. But paternity testing.